Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our budget briefing by the Honourable Mark Butler, Minister for Health and Aged Care. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're on. From all over the country, there are about 100 of us joining today. I'm in Wurundjeri country. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and um, also pay respects to their elders, both past, present and yet to come. I'd also like to acknowledge this land was never ceded and the importance of this year with a referendum coming up, giving the opportunity for a voice, um, which CHF is, um, as, as many other organisations are very supportive of. I'd also like to pay my respects to any First Nations people who are here with us today and indeed thank all of you as Australian health consumers in joining us to hear from the Minister. So as I said, um, we have the Honourable um, Mark Butler here with us today and he'll be providing us with his um, views on the budget, was in the May budget and what it might mean for consumers. And um, after that, we have a range of questions which you've sent in to us that you'd like us to ask the minister. So the next part of the session, um, thanks Carolyn, will be me um, moderating those questions for you all. And we'll finish with our chair, Mr. Tony Lawson, wrapping up the session for us all. So I know you're keen to hear from the minister and I wouldn't want to keep you from that. So I'd like to start by um, formally handing over to the minister and asking for him to provide us with his budget overview. Thank you. Thank, thank you um, so much, Elizabeth, and thanks for the invitation to be with you. Uh, coming to you from Adelaide, uh, the traditional lands of the Ghana people, and I also echo uh, um, Elizabeth's acknowledgement of country and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging in this critically important year for the nation on, on the long, long path to reconciliation with First Nations people. And I want to thank CHF for the support that uh, you are showing uh, to this referendum right across the community, uh, business groups, civil society groups, trade unions, faith groups, all of the premiers, Liberal and Labor alike, <coughs> sporting codes, uh, there, is, there is a real groundswell of support for this referendum. Uh, it's long beyond time to recognise the place of First Nations people. The High Court did it more than 30 years ago. It's time we did it in the nation's founding document, the, the, the Constitution. And I want to thank you, Elizabeth, for your acknowledgement and, and your support. Um, this budget, I, I said, um, really from the time we, we were still in opposition before last year's election would be uh, a budget where we sought to strengthen Medicare and particularly to rebuild general practice, which I have said and I genuinely believe is in its most parlous condition uh, in the 40 year, almost 40 year history of Medicare. Really interestingly, national cabinet meetings over the last several months, so meetings between the prime minister and all of the premiers and chief ministers uh, haven't um, haven't uh, been focused on hospital funding, which is typically the the way in which premiers and prime ministers discussed health policy with premiers coming to the Commonwealth for more hospital funding. They have been squarely focused on general practice and primary care because uh, state health ministers and state premiers see the pressure on general practice showing up every day in their hospital emergency departments because people simply can't get care that they need when they need it where they need it out in the community too often and they end up at hospital emergency departments where they frankly don't need to be often um, they should be able to be cared for out in the community um, so i did say um, unashamedly our top priority across all of the challenges we have in the health system after three years of a once in a century pandemic was to rebuild general practice and uh, and i really think we delivered on that commitment in the budget in may I want to talk very briefly about the elements of the budget because I see I see it really having two elements. One is I think it is a genuinely reform budget. It really does seek to deal with some of the challenges that people have been talking about, including including in uh, the CHF and other consumer and patient voices. People have been talking about the fact that Medicare hasn't kept up with the changing nature of patient needs and patient profiles. It was a system very much set up 
uh, uh, by the Hawke government 40 years ago, Neil Blewett um, from our state in South Australia, to deal with the health needs of Australians in the 1980s. And that was generally that you'd go to a doctor because you had a once-off infectious disease or you had an injury like falling off a ladder and you needed one-off treatment. And uh, you were treated, hopefully got better and then went away until you fell off the ladder again or got another infectious disease. As you know better than me, uh, the patient profile of today is very different. We're, we're, we're older on average and there is much more chronic disease that requires a different type of care, it requires wraparound care from a health team that will usually be led by a GP. It, it, it requires ongoing care rather than sort of single episodes of care that, that, that um, was more common in the 1980s and frankly is still the way in which Medicare is structured. So there's been this long discussion that many of you will be very familiar with for well over a decade about how we re-gear the Medicare system to reflect that patient need. And I think genuinely we, we had a good go at doing that um, uh, in the budget. We've got longer consultations in there that GPs can use to, to work over an extended period, over 60 minutes with patients with very complex chronic needs. Uh, many of them will be mental health needs. Many of them might be complex physical health needs. Some of them will be um, uh, women fleeing domestic violence. I mean, those groups have said they needed a, a longer consultation for GPs to work with, uh, with those patients and their families to, to, to step through the different responses needed. So you'll see that. You'll see urgent care centres that are that are really seeking to take that pressure off hospital emergency departments and provide, uh, provide patients or members of the community with access to bulk build services over extended hours for those non-life-threatening emergencies. Um, you know, when your kid falls off the skateboard, a burn, a deep cut, uh, something you need to, to, to have dealt with urgently, but doesn't necessarily need a hospital visit. Um, we're expanding the ability of general practice to provide high quality wound care are particularly important for people with chronic diseases like diabetes. This is a very expensive type of care for general practices to provide, to provide well uh, with quite expensive consumables. We will start funding those consumables for, for diabetes patients, uh, making it much easier for those patients to get good quality wound care before things get really bad and need to go to hospital, but also reflecting the, the skills and the experience that many nurses are able to deploy by delivering that care in a primary care setting. There's a big expansion of multidisciplinary care uh, in the budget, which will really lift the ability of general practice to employ practice nurses, to employ other allied health professionals. And in markets or for practices that are frankly too small to do that, pri uh, primary health networks or PHNs will be provided with funds to commission those services. I also want to see the PHNs innovate a bit uh, in this area. Uh, maybe to employ some social workers in regions to do social prescribing and things like that. So there was a real reform element, I think, to this budget. And, and I wanna pay tribute to the advice from the Strengthening Medicare Task Force of which Elizabeth was a, a really important member in helping guide the government's thinking about what the priority reforms were, what, what the things were that we needed to do quickly and would really start to shift the dial on the delivery of primary care to people out in the community. Beyond that though, there was, there was frankly also a substantial injection of funding uh, into general practice particularly, uh, mainly focused on bulk billing. Um, I have talked for some time about my sense of deep alarm at the reduction in bulk billing rates across the country. Uh, and over the last several months, I've had my department uh, publishing data that has much more detail in it than was previously published in, re in, in past years. So detail that really allows us to look at particular regions uh, because there is a great diversity across regions in bulk billing rates and see what is happening and find a way to, to turn that around. Tripling the bulk billing incentive will, um, as the College of GPs describe it, um, really be a game changer in general practice. In the major cities, uh, it, will, it will be an increase of more than a third uh, to the total fee paid to a GP for a standard consult. Um, out in the regions, 
um, it's more like a 50% increase. So for a standard consult uh, in a town in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales, just as one example, um, a, you know, a 10 or 15 minute consult will go from $50 to $75 uh, in terms of the total fee paid to a GP. I mean, that, that really will change things. And in addition to that, we have delivered a big boost to indexation in Medicare rebates across the board, which is the biggest increase to Medicare rebates in one year uh, uh, than we've seen since Paul Keating was Prime Minister more than 30 years ago. So again, hoping to really lift that financial sustainability of general practice and Medicare uh, across the board after several years of a freeze on the Medicare rebates that we saw um, during the last decade. So that really is that really was the, 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 the blend we tried to achieve uh, in this budget. An injection of funds at a time where general practice is under such financial pressure, but some real reform. So we do start to see Medicare changing to a system that more accurately reflects the profile of patients in the 2020s instead of the profile of patients in the 1980s and 1990s. Now, I don't want that just to be something that we set and forget, you know, that we move on as politicians or as a health minister or as a health department, and hopefully it all works out. And, and if it doesn't, we might come back to it in five years' time. We put in place some things I think are going to be really important to the implementation of this. The first thing uh, is to have a strong evaluation framework in place. You know, I want to make sure that consumers are engaged, that, that, that doctors groups, nursing groups, that academic experts are engaged to monitor the implementation of this and to allow us to build on it. And some of the reforms like the My Medicare reforms that seek to strengthen the relationship between patients and a local primary care practice, which will often be a general practice, I want to see that build over time, but build in a way that reflects um, what we learn as we, as, as we go on. So a strong evaluation framework with, with money behind that. And, and I uh, also um, was really keen to put our money where our mouth is as a government in terms of consumer engagement. You know, I have a very strong view um, that patients and consumers must be at the centre of health policy development, but also the delivery of that health policy. And the CHF is utterly critical to that. So, so funding in the budget, more than $10 million to CHF, will be really important in helping the, helping the CHF build capability for consumer advocates across the system. I mean, time and time again, um, consumer advocates are called on to come to the table and assist in policy development or the delivery of a particular research project or such like. Uh, and, and the CHF's ability to build those skills, uh, to equip those consumer advocates uh, with the skills that mean that they are at the table able to, to, um, to, uh, to deliver consumer perspectives and add value to the local project is something I, I firmly believe in. It builds on the commitment we made only a couple of months ago to fund a consumer peak for, for um, lived experience in mental health, which is something I did back in 2012. I allocated money in the 2012 budget to that. But a decade later, I, I came back to government realising that it was never actually delivered. So, you know, I think it was important that we as government put our money where our mouth is to, to um, to show that we're serious about putting patients and consumers at the centre of health policy development and implementation. So as we go forward and implement the package that, that I was very proud to deliver in last month's budget, I want to I want to make sure there's a frank and fearless CHF voice uh, tracking that implementation, advising us what we're doing well, uh, but also most importantly what we're not doing well and what we need to improve and how we build on the reforms that we announced in last May's budget. Um, because I'll close on this point, Elizabeth, uh, I tried to be really honest with Australians over the last 12 months uh, since we, I was appointed as health minister uh, about just how concerned I was at the state of Medicare. Um, I also tried to be uh, honest with Australians uh, about the fact that we weren't gonna fix that in one budget. I mean, this is, this is a, this is a, a, a state of concern around Medicare that, that, that has a whole bunch of different pressures on it. Some of them are 
demographic pressures I talked about. We are older, we have more complex chronic disease. Some of them reflect financial pressures that come from freezing the Medicare rebate for six years. And some of them obviously are legacies of us going through a once in a century pandemic uh, for the last now three and a half years or so. Um, so none of that is going to be turned around overnight. But, but, but this first budget is a really important foundation for doing the hard and in some cases long work of re-gearing this Medicare system of which we are all so proud and to which we're all so committed um, uh, to make sure that it that doesn't just last 40 years going back to 1984, but it lasts another 40 years going forward and gives future generations of Australians all of the wonderful things that's given to us over the last four decades. So thank you for all of the input that, that you have all had, mainly through Elizabeth as your representative on things like the Strengthening Medicare Task Force, but, but the many meetings that Elizabeth and Tony and other members of the CHF uh, infrastructure have had with me in the 12 months I've been the Health Minister, they've been incredibly important meetings, incredibly important inputs into my understanding about what I need to do as Health Minister uh, to make sure that our health system continues to be one of the very best in the world. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Minister, for those highlights and also the challenges you've set for all of us as consumers to be engaged and not to sit back and simply watch the reform process. So we asked um, consumers to give us questions they wanted to ask you. You won't be surprised to know we've got a very long list of questions. Um, and so, first of all, I'd just like to say to everyone, this is, we believe, the beginning of a conversation with the Minister and all of you. So we're hoping he'll be back again to talk to us again. So if your question didn't make it today, we will find a way either through our advocacy work or potentially maybe another time with the Minister to talk about those key issues. Because we've got so many questions, we've done a couple of things. We picked out those that were most common and also those that were most relevant to the budget to start with, start the conversation, given that's what today's about. And we've themed them up a bit. So sometimes there were two or three or four people with a similar question. We're going to start with allied health, for example. There were a lot of questions around allied health. So hopefully you'll recognise your question when it's asked. But my apologies, completely my fault if you don't. And some people wanted to ask their questions, others wanted to record, some didn't want to. So we've decided I'll read them out, but I'll mention um, your name if you were one of the key people that raised this issue um, as a way of making sure the minister knows that I just didn't make them all up because, you know, that's possible too. So the first question is about allied health and Julie Ryan, Leonie McGovern and Yasmina Brankovic were particularly keen on this. They really want to understand what the budget means for access to allied health professionals. They didn't see that in the budget, though perhaps it was there, and both in terms of recruitment as well as access. So what do you think you're doing now and will do to improve that? Thanks, that, that's such a terrifically important question. And, and as you know, Elizabeth, this was raised a lot on the Strengthening Medicare Task Force uh, by you, by others on the task force, but also obviously by allied health uh, representatives on the, on the task force who were there as well. Um, other than the bulk billing incentive uh, change, which was really the, the centrepiece of our strengthening Medicare package, I think probably the next biggest investment that you see in that package is to something called the Workforce Incentive Program or the WIP. And, and this is money that, that is paid to general practice to engage um, allied health professionals, but also practice nurses in their in their practice to give that wraparound multidisciplinary or team-based care that, that I talked about earlier. And uh, we gave a very big increase to, to that, like a 30% increase uh, to, that, to that payment. And as well, we are indexing it every year for the first time. Um, it's never been indexed or increased on a yearly basis. We're indexing it in line with wages, which makes sense, given it's a payment that's used by general practice to pay wages. As well, I think I, I also mentioned um, that the PHNs will be provided with substantial funds to commission allied health services, also some, some sort of innovative services, like I, I think I mentioned maybe social workers for some social prescribing, again, to, to allow that to be delivered, um, particularly in some of the what we call thin markets where there, where, where there is real difficulty recruiting those workers and that that will often be in rural and regional Australia but in some of our 
outer suburbs of the major cities as well. I think I think implicit. So there's a school group going past my office window, so I might be a bit loud. Um, uh, I think also implicit in that question is it's just a reflection that it's quite difficult to get allied health right now. Um, as as many of you would know, the the big expansion in the NDIS over recent years uh, has taken a lot of allied health workers into that system and made it. I know we're experiencing difficulty in aged care. Uh, um, being able to employ a lot of those you know, OTs, speech pathologists, and some of those allied health workers. Uh, but that's happening in primary care as well. And I know state governments are having that difficulty. So, so uh, it is something we're particularly focused on. In terms of connections, can I just maybe close on this point? One of the things that our, the, the allied health representatives on strengthening Medicare uh, really talked about was the lack of their connection to my health record. And this was a dig digital connections and making sure that that that, that all everyone sort of connected with patient consent, obviously, to my health record was a, was a big part of that discussion on the task force, as Elizabeth knows. And uh, in the budget again, uh, there is there is funding to start to connect allied health providers to my health record, so that they're also sort of part of the health team that is supporting um, consumers and patients. Great, thanks, Minister. The, the next question is about rural and remote and particularly around what people might call fund holding or shared budgets. Um, there are some models here in place. Both Claire Mullen and Mark Diamond have asked, do, do you have any appetite for more place-based or regionally controlled budgets um, as proposed by the National Rural Health Alliance, that idea that a community might control how money moves through its um, you know, yep. population. Yeah, thanks, Claire and Mark. Um, uh, as Elizabeth knows, that was something we talked about. There was, there was really good rural uh, and regional representation on the task force. The Rural Health Commissioner uh, was there, but also uh, ACRAM, the College of Rural and Remote Medicine, was, was there as well. Uh, and, and everyone, uh, even those of us from cities, uh, recognised that some of the access issues that, 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 that we see across the country are much more acute in rural and regional Australia. Uh, the great thing about um, out there, though, is that, that we are, we are uh, I think there's, there's more latitude to test and demonstrate the efficacy of, of new models in rural and regional Australia than, frankly, there is in cities sometimes. There's, there's more openness uh, by communities, but also by health professionals out there to try new things. And we've got a, a stream of funding that we put in place in the October budget last year uh, for innovative models of care in rural and regional Australia. And we are trialling some of those things like funds holding, uh, like nurse practitioner-led models of care, particularly in communities that simply can't get a GP into them. Uh, and um, I am keen to start to see some of those funds holding commissioning service models um, trialled in rural and regional Australia. We didn't, well, I want to be honest, we didn't move at this budget to a scaled system like the RUT show system um, that, that, is, that is sometimes talked about and implicit in your question, Mark and Claire. But, but um, you know, I think what we want to do is, is give some funds to demonstrate these models of care through that funding stream I talked about. Uh, and learn from that and see what we might be able to do. Uh, this is also something I think that has huge potential in the area of mental health uh, for PHNs to do some commissioning in rural communities to, to connect not only the sort of Commonwealth funded services, but to connect to state funded services as well. That's something I'm really interested in looking more deeply at in the area of mental health as we move to to that challenge in the second half of this year. Thanks, Minister. Uh, dental care, we've just put a submission in to the um, inquiry into dental care and Leonie Short and Leonie McGovern asked about what's being done to improve the funding and services for dental care and particularly in two areas. One is the rural, which you've spoken about, but you might want to comment on further. And the second is within aged care. Mm. Well, um, well, uh, as, as people with a particular interest in aged care will know, this was a, this was a bit of a focus of the Royal Commission. Um, th there are principles in that, that guide um, the expectations of aged care providers, 
uh, and I'm talking particularly about residential aged care providers that, uh, that, that require them to maintain good oral health of their, of their residents. But I think the Royal Commission demonstrated that's, that's not always, frankly, the case. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, there were some recommendations that we're still stepping through from the Royal Commission about that. That wasn't, that wasn't a focus of this, of this budget, but, but it's something as we step through all 148 of those recommendations, uh, we will be working through. More broadly, uh, in the area of dental, there is between health ministers, so me and my state and territory colleagues, uh, there is a dental reform piece of work that, um, that South Australia is actually leading on behalf of all jurisdictions. Uh, one of the things I think that will consider is whether or not we move dental services into the national hospital funding agreement that is due for renegotiation over the next couple of years. In the interim, um, at, the, at the budget in May, we extended our funding as a Commonwealth to states for public dental services for that period of time. So, so funding would be, would be provided to states while we worked out whether we were going to put it into the hospital funding agreement or not. Um, before the budget, there was no funding for, for public dental services beyond the 30th of June. So if we weren't able to find that, that new, new money, public dental services were, were going to go unfunded for the first time in many decades. So, so that is something um, that, that we've been able to do, and, and I know that's been welcomed by state governments and public dental services. As, as, as those of you who have an expertise in this area will know, there are rural loadings to encourage states to deliver those services outside of the major cities. Um, that, will, that will obviously, the, the extent to which they do that will be part of that reform work that, um, that South Australia is leading. Uh, but uh, but, but there's, I guess that, that demonstrates there's a few pieces of different work going on right now uh, around dental care uh, that will bear on those two questions, but we didn't land that in the budget a few weeks ago, I think it's fair to say. Can't do everything at once, right, Minister? So um, mental health, there were a few different questions about mental health. Um, particularly though around the changes to better access. And Devon Lamb asked, you know, what's happening with this? I can't get the sessions I got before. Um, is there a plan for more extensive sessions to be provided to any mental health um, consumers in the future? So better access um, always provided a maximum of 10 funded sessions um, for many years. Uh, the former government then increased that to 20 uh, as a COVID measure, it was a response to, to the lockdowns particularly, and it was only ever a time limited um, arrangement uh, that, that was funded by the former government in their budget last year to the end of December 2022. Um, now, frankly, that was pretty controversial when it happened. People like Ian Hickey and, and others warned at the time uh, that it was likely to, to aggravate waiting lists and make it harder for new people to get into the system. Um, and as, as we were thinking about what to do in the future around the Better Access Scheme and frankly, some other mental health programs, I received an evaluation of Better Access uh, that I published in December. Um, I received an evaluation for Better Access more than 10 years ago when I was the Mental Health Minister. Uh, and this new evaluation demonstrated pretty much the same problems that we confronted 10 years ago. And that is uh, that um, this is a good scheme for people who are able to get it, but it's very hard for people to get it uh, outside of inner city suburbs. In the outer suburbs of the cities, and certainly in rural and regional Australia, it's very hard to get access to high quality psychological therapy. And what that means is people in those communities who usually have much higher levels of mental distress um, are more likely simply to be medicated, the evaluation found, rather than given access to psychology therapy. What the evaluation also found, as Ian Hickey had, had predicted, is that the addition of 10 extra sessions for some people meant that, that a whole bunch of other people who wanted to get into the system, who were referred by their GPs to get into the system, weren't able to get any sessions. So the number of new entrants actually plummeted by tens and tens of thousands um, because of the, the fact that some people were getting more, um, more people were getting none. And uh, 
Uh, what we have found since, since it went back down to his, its historical level of 10, instead of some people getting 20, is that over the last three months, over the first three months of this year, 2023, um, tens and tens of thousands more people got access to better access. Uh, and so it has had that, that benefit that I pointed out in December. What I wanted to do was to, to try and expand the number who were able to get psychology services instead of having a smaller number getting more, um, have more people getting, getting something. Now, we are still working on, on, a, on what we're going to do in mental health more broadly in response to that evaluation. I've said to mental health groups that we, we weren't ready uh, to deliver that in May. And I think most mental health groups, actually, I think all mental health groups that I've been working with over the last several months since December, when I published that evaluation, recognise that, that we, we haven't yet arrived at a position. And so um, I've said uh, that will be delivered over the course of the second half of this year. We're continuing to do that work. Um, I guess what I need to do in response to that evaluation is deal with the fact that, that, that there's too many communities who aren't getting access to anything, you know, and that's particularly in out, outer suburbs of the cities and rural and regional Australia. How do, we, how do we make the system more equitable in terms of access? So it's not just the suburbs in the, in the inner parts of our cities that are getting good, good, good access. So that, that first point of equity is really important. How then do we make sure that, that there are services for people with more complex needs? I mean, what the evaluation found is that the people getting more sessions, so getting 20 sessions, not 10, actually didn't have more complex needs than people getting just 10 or people getting none. Um, this is not a good system to identify and triage people between those who have more complex needs and those who have less complex needs. So how do we make sure that there's an offering, there's a service there for people with more complex needs uh, was the second challenge of the evaluation. And I think uh, is, 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 is also an important piece of work that I'm engaged in with, with the sector. Great, thanks, Minister. 60-day um, prescribing. So this is something that came out of the budget and there's been a lot of conversation in the media about this change to prescribing. Could you give consumers your sense of what this might mean um, and then perhaps also talk about the opioid sus substitution therapy and the changes there too? Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. This is a really interesting um, issue, which has obviously been quite contested um, by the pharmacy guild, uh, and I understand why. Their, their, their job is to represent, represent the interests of pharmacy businesses. Um, who will be affected by this change. But let me step back to the sort of reason why uh, we're going down this path. And it comes back to what I talked about around the nature of Medicare and the changing patient profile over the last several decades. When you, when you um, have a system that really is built around people getting sick for a short period of time and going to a doctor and getting a medicine as a one-off, taking that medicine, getting better and then going away until they get sick again. It makes sense to have a 30 day limit on supply. Um, nowadays, uh, far more common is, is the situation where patients are on a medicine, not for a short period of time, but for years and in some cases for decades. Um, heart medication, blood pressure medication, cholesterol medicines, a whole bunch of other conditions see people on the same medicine at the same dose year upon year upon year upon year for chronic disease. And um, in most other countries to which we would usually compare ourselves, for those patients on those medicines, you're able to get a longer supply than just 30 days. Now, five years ago, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, which oversees the PBS, a group of experts that provide government advice about, um, about the PBS listing of medicines, said that for people on chronic disease medicines, they should be able to get a longer supply so they don't have to keep going back to the GP to get a repeat script, very routine. They don't have to keep going back to a pharmacy every, every month, paying money over the counter, the inconvenience of having to visit the pharmacy and so on and so forth. It's not efficient. 
um, and and it's not an effective use of resources, whether it's government resources or patient resources. Now, the former government decided for their own reasons not to do anything about that. Um, over the summer, I got updated advice from the, the PBAC uh, and um, it said that we should do that for these chronic disease medicines, um, allow patients to get 60 days supply or even 90 days supply. Now we, we've taken the decision to go with 60 days supply. We think that that is um, the right balance between the interests of patients and the interests of, uh, of maintaining a, a viable community pharmacy sector that we think is important. Um, it will make a real difference to the hip pocket of consumers who only have to pay six co-payments for a medicine every year instead of 12. It'll free up millions of GP visits, literally millions, which is why all the doctors groups have come out and supported it. You know, these are routine visits. Go in, just get a repeat script. Um, uh, free up a whole lot of consults for people with more complex and more urgent needs. Um, but it will also be good for people's health because we know, everyone on this, um, on this webinar knows, that the time you're most likely to go off your medicine is when your script ends and you can't get in to see a doctor or, you, or you're just too busy to get to a pharmacy. And evidence from overseas where they have these longer periods of dispensing, 60 or 90, to day, 90 days, 90 days is quite common, um, uh, we, we know that medicine compliance in those jurisdictions is increased by about 20%. Um, so it's really good for health. We know, we know um, cheaper medicines is good for health because it means people aren't choosing between their rent or their groceries and their medicines on the other hand. But we also know having longer script times improves medicine compliance as well. So from our point of view, it's a no-brainer. It, it, it relieves pressure on GPs. It's good for patient or consumer health. It's good for consumer hip pockets at a time of really serious uh, cost of living pressure. Um, but on the other hand, we of course have to maintain a, a viable community pharmacy sector. And so we've decided to, we've made a commitment to invest all of the money we save as a Commonwealth because we pay a, we pay a fee every time a box of medicines or a bottle of medicine goes over the counter. We save about 1.2 billion. All of that money will be reinvested back into community pharmacy. Uh, so we're confident we can do this in a way that maintains the viability of the community pharmacy sector. Uh, your your follow-up question, Elizabeth, was around opioid dependence treatment. And for many years, uh, um, as some of you will know, people who have an opioid dependence or opioid addiction um, issue uh, have had to pay quite substantial fees to get their methadone or um, a buprenorphine injections that are increasingly common now. I think about a quarter of opioid addicts are getting those long lasting injections, but they're having to pay out quite substantial fees that might be, you know, I've heard different estimates, but some estimates I've heard as much as 150 a week, certainly in the hundreds of dollars per month. Uh, we've taken the decision to put that on the PBS as a, as a, as a highly specialised drug so that people with, with those, those issues will be paying PBS prices. And, and I think that is a really important advance for us in the treatment of this addiction like any other health issue. Health issue. This is a medicine to, to treat a serious um, health issue. And from the 1st of July, people will be able to get this important medicines at, at PBS prices through community pharmacies. We're also working with some of the clinics that you might have seen in, in some news reports who um, have built businesses uh, around the idea of private billing. So having people pay whatever it is, a couple of hundred dollars a month at least for these medicines. And we're working on transitional arrangements to, to support the, the, the transition to this new system with those clinics. I don't want to see them shut down if they're providing important other services to people with opioid addiction issues. Um, but, I, but I think we've got to keep our focus on the benefit to these consumers, these patients. Um, this is really important treatment for them to deal with a very serious addiction issue. And frankly, it's far beyond time that they should have got these treatments at PBS prices. And I'm very proud of the fact we delivered that in the last budget.
Yeah, thanks, Minister. A very important reform for a lot of people who, as you said, if they can't afford their medicine, they're going to take it. Um, there are consequences and hopefully this will prevent this. Now, a lot of the questions have been about access and about workforce, and I think we recognise that people are finding it hard to get access to workforce and that can't be solved overnight. Um, and even if you do make things cheaper or make it possible for people to, to go less often to, for a range of reasons, we still come back to um, we can't get access and there aren't enough workforce. But one of the obvious solutions for that is health literacy. The more people know about keeping themselves well, the better they understand the system, the less they need to rely on um, some clinical support, though recognising some people always will, um, and more they can do for themselves and support community. So with the changes coming up with Medicare reform, and also a little bit of PBS reform, really, in what you're starting to do. Um, people asked about health literacy and particularly about how the government will be communicating changes. So um, Paul Swan asked about the upcoming Medicare changes um, and, you know, the work of the Strengthening Medicare Task Force. How will consumers know when things come online and how to interact with them? What's your plan for not just engaging people in implementation, but for the, say, 24 and a half million that aren't involved in that bid? How do we keep them informed? Uh, su such a good question um, and comes back to that point I tried to make in my introductory remarks about, you know, us not just delivering the budget, set and forget, and, you know, we as a government move on to our next challenge because there's any number of them in the health portfolio. Uh, you know, we're, we're, still, we're still working through that and um, our engagement with your organisation, Elizabeth, is really, really crucial to us understanding how we can communicate this best we don't we don't always know that uh, in Canberra not that I'm in Canberra I'm in Adelaide but you know we don't always know that in the in the federal government in the federal bureaucracy we rely very heavily on advice from organizations like yours and your member organizations Elizabeth and and um, we'll be very keen we don't we don't want to just you know fund these programs and have no one know about them We've got a challenge to communicate them to consumers, frankly, also to, consume, to communicate them to health providers, um, uh, particularly in the primary care sector. Um, so I, I'd really welcome ideas uh, about, about that um, and an ongoing dialogue with your organisation, Elizabeth, about, about how we do this. Um, I, know, uh, I know we talked about this a bit in the task force. Uh, of all the... Um, utterly terrible things that came from this pandemic, and, and it truly has been terrible. Um, we need to try and find some slivers of, of, of opportunity out of this and out of this experience. And, and one of them is, is, I think, a really heightened sense of health literacy in the community. I mean, the community now understands the intricacies of parts of the health system in a way that, that would have been unimaginable five years ago. Um, around vaccines and a whole bunch of other things. So, so how do, how do we grasp some of these opportunities that we that we have as people have become more literate with elements of their own health, how to how to maintain that health, but also how the health system works and how the two interact. Uh, I think is is um, uh, is a window that will remain open for a, a period, but only for a period. It will close if, if we, as consumer representatives, as governments, as health providers, don't, don't grasp the opportunities um, uh, which, which come from this awful experience that we've all had over the last three and a half years. So I'm sorry that's not a particularly concluded question where I can say we've got this particular program coming out or this communications campaign. Uh, we recognise that we've got work to do over the course of the second half of the year as these things roll out, whether they're PBS-based changes or Medicare changes. Uh, and I really want to work with the CHF on making sure we do that in a really informed way. Fantastic. Thanks, Minister. Um, the next question um, comes to the pandemic. It's about long COVID. So um, Rachel Makepeace and, and Kirsty Yeats have raised this issue. Um, the money that was announced for long COVID research, $50 million. Um, still, you know, there are problems in relation to uh, getting a good diagnosis, getting the treatment you want. And how, what's your plan involving consumers in decisions about how long COVID is researched and then how it's managed in the community? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, the this is a, a, a diabolically complex area. Um, very diverse range of conditions into this basket uh, we describe as long COVID. Um, some of which resolve uh, in the first three months after infection, uh, with with not much impact beyond the three months. Um, some of which are quite specific uh, conditions or sequelae. They might be cardiac, for example, that require uh, um, treatment from a cardiologist. Um, and some of which, the third sort of category, are longer multi-system disorders. Um, and I think there's like some 200 different symptoms that have been categorised uh, across the international literature that, that are hard to diagnose and hard to treat. And um, understanding the, the prevalence of this issue in, in Australia um, has been a, a challenge. We had a parliamentary inquiry that, that many of you might have followed or even participated in that Mike Freelander chaired that informed a lot of our initial response over the last month or six weeks, because we wanted to understand the prevalence here in Australia that's quite different to the prevalence in the US and the UK, which has really been the source of most of the global uh, studies, because uh, so many patients or so many people in the US and UK were infected before widespread vaccination, the vast bulk of infections here in Australia, by contrast, took place after vaccination. We know uh, that, that the impact here is still very substantial, but will qualitatively and quantitatively probably be a bit different to the UK and the US. So that's why we, after a recommendation from that parliamentary inquiry, decided to allocate substantial funds to research. We're in the process, as we always do in the MRFF, the Medical Research Future Fund, uh, we're in the process of putting together an expert advisory panel uh, which will have consumer representation on it uh, and, uh, and then start funding uh, research projects that will be properly peer reviewed and the like. The other big question that people ask um, is, uh, how do I get service? Now, uh, one of the things we've, we've been at pains to stress is that obviously that the, the first, uh, the first source and, and for, for most patients, the that the main source of support and treatment they'll get is from their primary care provider and generally their general practice. And we've tried to be clear that the chronic disease management items in the MBS are available there. You don't actually have to wait the full six months if the treating practitioner is of the view clinically that the condition is likely to last beyond six months. They're able to access the CDM, the chronic disease management items uh, before six months is actually up. So, so we try to be sort of clear with GPs particularly about that. Some states have been funding long COVID clinics. Um, they're able to do that under the, the um, health reform agreement, the hospital funding agreement that, that we contribute pretty much half of the funds to. They'll make their own decisions about that. I know that there are different approaches being taken in different states, but, but um, you know, I really want to stress that, that, that there are there is, there is substantial capacity in the Medicare system to treat um, these conditions. The challenge is obviously the clinical workforce um, understanding it, uh, being able to diagnose it in a timely fashion and being able to treat it. Uh, you know, I think we're all very worried about the scale of this challenge, uh, most obviously for people impacted by it, but for the health system as well. Uh, you know, it is, it is, there are different numbers tossed around, but whichever number, even if you lose, use some of the lower numbers, we're talking about very large numbers of Australians hit by one of those three categories, as I described them, one of those sort of three categories of long COVID. Uh, and it's, uh, and it's something that, that we are continuing to have to pay attention to. Thanks, Minister. We're, you'll be pleased to know we've got a couple of questions left, so you're doing really well. No one has yet in the chat given you a mark out of 10, but I would say that you're doing very well and you should continue along these veins. Um, we want to move into the future now. The next two questions are really more about the future and one's about AI. 
So this was a question provided by um, Kate Sinclair. And the question is, you know, AI will have an impact on health. We know that. So I suppose the two bits are, first of all, how do you see that it might shape health, particularly in the next few years? And then how do we manage the risks that come with AI shaping health? Yeah, I think so. I mean, for most of us, um, I, I, I am, I'm a long way from a digital expert. For most of us, AI really sort of jumped out uh, at all of us when chat GPT was released, I think um, maybe November. So it's still very, very, very recent. And um, uh, unless you're really into this stuff, for most of us, we're still trying to get our heads around what, what all this means for the community. And you will have seen, you know, the last fortnight, some pretty, pretty alarming headlines. You know, it's an extinction risk and all the rest. So, um, so I think, governments, communities, businesses, civil society are really trying to catch up quickly with a technology that took a very big leap forward over the last six or 12 months um, and try to separate the opportunities that come from this, and I think there are some, uh, with the risks. And um, you know, I know there are a number of health groups, I'm not sure I've seen a public position from yours, Elizabeth, but I know the AMA has been quite uh, open in their, their sort of amber light warning, if you like, for us to be very careful about how this technology steps into the health system and how we put in place good guardrails to protect privacy, to, to ensure safety and all those sorts of things that are, that are hallmarks of a good, a good functioning healthcare system. Um, broadly speaking, I think at a Commonwealth level, uh, we don't have as a policy position um, uh, 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 the support to use particularly generative AI in, in Commonwealth health programs. So you shouldn't be concerned that there's, there's sort of suddenly some, some new element to the operation of our healthcare system. There's, there's very much a, a sense of caution at the Commonwealth government level about letting this thing run into systems unchecked. Um, on the other hand, without sort of a so as not to appear a complete Luddite, uh, I have spoken to researchers about some of the opportunities that, that come from this, the ability of, of AI to, to harness and bring together a whole lot of information, some of which is genomic, some of which is, is obviously de-identified um, data around PBS usage, MBS usage, and things like that, to give us much better prediction about, about um, disease risk and, and treatment potentials is, is there. There's no question about that, I think, that there, that there, are, um, there are real opportunities, I think, that, that well-meaning, clever researchers talk to me about uh, that, would, that it would improve our ability to, um, to predict and to identify and in, intervene early in diseases that sometimes take years to, to sort of manifest. So um, again, um, I apologise for that not being a particularly definitive response. I guess what I'd like to assure you is that we are alive to the, the risks here uh, and the concerns out in the community about this thing um, getting too far ahead of community understanding and community confidence that those privacy risks and, and safety and efficacy guarantees have been looked after by governments and, uh, and, um, and had the ruler run over them by consumer organisations, including CHF. Thanks, Minister. So on to our final question, which is one that came from Fiona Hammond, and we think it's a great way to finish the session, which is, you mentioned this is a budget that begins a journey of reform. Um, 10 years time, I don't know what you're doing, I don't know what I'm doing, but when you look back at this, how would you like this budget to be remembered? Well, it started, it started the process of strengthening and modernising Medicare. Um, sort of that, that simple, really. Uh, we're only a few months from the 40th birthday of Medicare, and it was hard fought. Um, not sure if you can see, I've got, got the old man behind me. Um, I'm in my electorate office, so it's got political photos around it, so I apologise for, for that. Uh, but I've got Goff looking over my shoulder he started, he started the journey. It was hard for him. 
he made decisions that 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 Bob uh, and Neil Blewett and others continued with, for example, to not to have dental care or oral health care in in there, which were have always been controversial. Um, but landing this this universal health care system was a long fight. Uh, where Labor was opposed by a lot of groups, including doctors groups, but um, political opponents and such like for a long period of time. And we landed it in the eighties. It took a long time to, to, to develop deep enough roots to, to be safe from repeal. Um, uh, and, and I guess what that says is that we as a Labor party um, have a little bit of territorial pride around around Medicare and it's very much in our DNA to nurture it, protect it uh, and to strengthen it for the future. But that's not just a labor thing. I, I think what's clear is is the community cherishes Medicare, but they also recognize that it's it's been under enormous pressure uh, because it hasn't kept pace with some of the changes in our community. Uh, that we've talked about. It's been under additional pressure because of those financial freezes last decade and, and obviously COVID. Um, but they expect their government to, to deal with those pressures. They want to they see Medicare preserved, strengthened, modernised um, for the next 40 years and, and, and maybe beyond that as well. Um, and that's going to be that's going to be some long work. You know, turning around the numbers in general practice is not going to happen overnight. Uh, and it's going to be a work that will, will require a genuine partnership with the best of intention and the best of ability to, to lever more money out of, out of the government into Medicare. We can't do this alone as a government. We need a strong partnership uh, with consumers. We need a strong partnership with health providers. Uh, and uh, we got that over the last 12 months through the Strengthening Medicare Task Force, a really positive, constructive process. We've got it through the development of the budget. Uh, we want to continue that in coming years, which is why I'm really delighted to be on, on this, to get your questions, to be accountable to you. Uh, I don't want this just to be the only time I come before you. I'd love an invitation to come back pretty regularly if, if, um, if you can find time. Uh, but that very, much, uh, if, that very much is my ambition. Uh, there's lots of challenges in the healthcare system, but none more important than strengthening and modernising Medicare for the future. Thank you. And thank you so much for your generosity and your transparency, Minister. I'd like to thank my team for organising today's session and also um, a thanks to every single one of you for attending. Um, I'd like to now pass to uh, my chair, Mr Tony Lawson, to finish the session. Thanks, Tony. You're on mute, Tony. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, on behalf of CHF and the participants in the webinar today, I'd like to take this opportunity to sincerely thank you, Minister, for your ongoing support and commitment and taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us today. Um, you have certainly have demonstrated your commitment to listening to consumers, not only through this webinar, but at other times, including the face-to-face -face roundtable we held with you in Adelaide recently. Uh, since April, some 6,000 consumers have signed our, our petition asking for the government to give consumers a voice in st strengthening Medicare reforms and, and you are certainly doing that. Most importantly, and as you uh, mentioned, uh, CHF has been provided with enhanced funding in the budget uh, for over the next four years, and this will allow us to broaden our engagement with the consumers, and uh, this will build our uh, capacity to uh, engage with consumers on the strengthening Medicare reforms and we we sincerely thank you for that. There's no doubt that by giving uh, consumers a greater say in the design and implementation uh, of health reforms, we are enable them to bring their wisdom to the table and, um, and ultimately, hopefully, uh, deliver a better, um, more equitable and accessible 
health system for all Australians. So on behalf of everyone on the webinar today and for those who'll be listening later, we thank you and really appreciate your ongoing commitment. Thank you very much.